thank you guys for being here. Um, it really does mean a lot. I know it's a Wednesday afternoon and you know common apps are coming up, so I really appreciate it, especially the students for being here. Um, before I get started, I want to thank everyone who's helped promote this event and also sponsored it. So that includes Vermont Network, Emerge Vermont, Peace and Justice Center, the South Prince of Rotary, PAC, CARE, CARE Vermont, Ch Change the Story, Lane Grox, Ferry and Wool, uh, LLP, Sue Minter, the Women's March Vermont, YWCA Vermont, Champlain College, Johnston State University, and One World Library. Um, also a big thank you to all the media who's helped promote this event. So that includes uh, Channel 17, who's filming this right now, uh, Vermont Digger, Burlington Free Press, WCAX, Vermont Public Radio, and the other paper. Um, I also want to thank the speakers for being here today. So Senator Leahy's office is here, Senator Sanders' office, Representative Welsh, the Vermont Commission on Women, and uh, the Refugee Outreach Club. Um, and then I also really want to thank the organizers of this, of this event, because this would not be happening without them. So um, can you guys stand? Um, it's Sophie, Hawa, Dina, Lina, Lachmadi, and Lina Ganawi. So let's give them a round of applause. So we're all here today for the International Day of the Girl, and the International Day of the Girl is a youth-led movement focusing attention uh, on the need to address the challenges girls face and to promote girls' empowerment and fulfillment of their human rights. This day was established by the United Nations in 2011, and today we'll be talking about um, education specifically and how that affects girls worldwide. Um, before we start, I want to talk a little bit about results. So um, would Dina and Howard join me down here? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Hawa. I'm a senior at Burlington High School, and yeah, I'm a member of Results. Um, hi, my name is Dina. I'm a sophomore at St. Michael's College, and I joined Results thanks to Karen because she introduced me um, to the fact that you can get involved and advocate even when, um, no matter how old you are, no matter what your educational attainment is, you can get involved, and it really makes a great impact. So, yeah. yeah. And I just helped kind of build the results up from the bottom um, and with Karen here. And basically, we've just been doing a lot of lobbying work and a lot of um, work in the community, trying to engage other people and really like get these bills passed. And I, I love results because you get to um, really tell your stories um, to people that don't usually take into consideration or that you normally feel intimidated by, um, legislators and representatives. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, it's, as a young person, it's good for them to finally hear it and be able to share that and tell why these issues are important. Yeah, and so Results is an international movement, a nonprofit that works to end global poverty as well as U.S. poverty um, through grassroots lobbying. So it really is very grassroots. It's an amazing organization. Uh, Dina and I had the opportunity this summer to go to the, uh, the international conference in D.C. and you know, going on Capitol Hill was just absolutely amazing to know that you could really make your voice heard on such a global level. Well, I can't even vote. You know, I can do that and I can't vote, which is pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, so if you guys are interested in joining results, we have sign-up forms outside as well. And our next meeting is Tuesday at 6.30 at the Peace and Justice Center. Um, feel free to talk to any of us about it, sign up online, or sign up using the form outside and reaching out to us via our Facebook page. So we're going to uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with our speakers. Um, first up, we have Natalie from the Refugee Outreach Club. <laughs> Hi everyone, I just wanted to say, say thank you so much Karen and the rest of the results team for inviting me to participate in this great event tonight. I'm the founder and executive director of Refugee Outreach Club Inc. And our mission at Rock is to connect young adults around the world through education, curiosity, and service. Right now, we're living in a world where it is vital to have young people connecting to solve the problems we face as humans. My original goal of Rock Inc was to have high school students involved in and learning about the international community and become active participants. The enthusiasm of students was incredibly contagious as we now have six high school chapters and two college chapters with more coming. All students are involved and able to work directly with the new American and refugee community here in the greater Burlington area and become involved in different guest speaker events and different fundraisers throughout the year. Rock, Rock Inc.'s global initiatives include a cultural exchange program where students are able to engage in weekly tutoring or in video calls with students in Ghana, 
And for our college chapter program, we're taking students to Ghana this year to work as medical and educational volunteers. And we're creating a college readiness program for refugees here in Vermont. All of our Rock Inc. programs, whether they're local or international, are all based on the common mission that we're all more alike than different, and that we can learn from one another's differences. We want to help educate our youth that regardless of where you come from, that we can learn from each other's perspectives and grow together. In honor of International Day of Girl and as the spokeswoman of Rock Inc., I want to stress the importance of equal opportunity for women in terms of education and healthcare. As a young woman myself, I understand the barriers that we all face. I worked and lived in Ghana this year for two and a half months, and being the only white female under the age of 18 in the entire area, I learned the importance of being able to stand up for myself and that no matter who you are or where you come from, we all have struggle, struggles and we all deserve respect. Although we are young, we have a voice and that voice is valid. I envision a world where all women and girls in Ghana and around the world have access to education and that even students from the wealthiest communities here in the United States have a global perspective and want to help make a valuable change in this world. I am proud today to announce that Rock Inc. has acquired a program called Project Girl with the mission of promoting health, education, and full civic particip participation of young African women in Ghana by providing non-disposable sanitary materials that are produced in Africa for African women and girls. In this way, girls will no longer have to stay out of school because they're menstruating. We're very excited about this new program and the growth that we have had as an organization over the past three years. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or would like to be involved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so next up we have, um, from the Vermont Commission on Women, uh, Commissioner Mary, Ma Mary Beth Redmond and Commission Commissioner Gretchen Bailey. So give them a round of applause. So uh, the Vermont Commission on Women is part of the state government here in Vermont. The official description of what we, who we are and what we do is we're a nonpartisan state commission working to advance rights and opportunities for women and girls. We have 16 volunteer commissioners. We have 28 advisory organizations. These are organizations that work on women's issues around the state in different ways. Um, and those, those folks guide our education, coalition building, and advocacy efforts. So basically, we're an official part of the state government, a small staff, very good staff of three people, 16 commissioners who are volunteers. I've been a commissioner since 2006. Mary Beth is one of our newest commissioners, and one of our other commissioners, you, some of you, several of you will know, because Nancy LaVarnway is also a commissioner on the Vermont Commission on Women. Um, so, we, we work with legislators, we work with the governor, we work with other state agencies, we work with the advisors to do anything that comes up in Vermont, or we work also with the representatives from the congressional delegations in Vermont on federal issues. So it's w things that affect women and girls. And some of the major categories, education, health, economic justice, civil rights, social justice, so that's the, the overview. And this, we meet once a month, we do various projects, we write a booklet called Legal Rights of Women in Vermont, and we try to keep that updated. And we have other materials from some of our uh, work on the table outside. And so Mary Beth is gonna focus on one of our major projects right now. Thanks, Gretchen. Hi. Yeah. Thanks so much, Gretchen. Um, I wanted to just uh, make you aware of a project that the Vermont Commission on Women is involved in and has been over the last few years. Um, the project is called Change the Story. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, we have four reports that we issued, um, and they, are, they basically came about because as the commission started to look at um, 
the state of women and girls in Vermont, we started to realize that there were lots of holes in the data that is kept by the state, ways that we were not able to properly measure how women and girls are doing in the state. So with the help of some UVM professors, we commissioned these four research studies. The first one is on women and wages in Vermont. Um, the second, women in work. The third, on women-owned businesses and what's happening there. And the last one that came out just shortly ago on women in leadership. So um, these reports are outside. Um, they're fascinating just about what is going on in Vermont around the state of women and girls. And the bottom line is, is things aren't that great. Um, just to throw out one little statistic here, 43% of Vermont women who work full time do not make enough to cover their basic living expenses. So there are some real issues and real problems here in Vermont that the commission is working very closely with legislators to address. Um, so I would encourage you to look at these um, reports, kind of take them in. There's a lot of good data that has been out there but never aggregated together to kind of be in one place. Um, and one other thing I'll mention is we're getting ready to kind of go on a tour of Vermont coming up in the next year. In 2018, we will have listening tours around the state where we want to hear from women and girls about what is the primary barrier that keeps you from economic security in the state. And all of that information will help inform our policy work with the legislature. So um, we're really excited to kind of begin this year and really be kind of the eyes and ears um, for all of you. Um, and we'll be coming to a neighborhood near you to really receive your impact, your, your input. So thank you all very much. All right, so now we have Ken to talk a little bit more about global education. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you tonight. My name is Ken Patterson. I'm the director of Global Grassroots Advocacy for Results. Um, so I manage our national network of volunteers who are advocating to, to end poverty through our US foreign policy. So they're talking to their senators and their representatives about how we're investing in things like girls' education, global health, economic opportunity. Um, they're using the media, and then they're mobilizing community members. So this average everyday people really figuring out how to be effective and creating the kind of change that they want to create in the world. And Kieran and, and uh, the rest of the crew here have been really effective in using results tools to make a difference with your senators and representatives here and establishing relationships with their offices. So I want to, I want to, I might wander around here a little bit if that's okay, because sometimes I do that when I, when I talk, but I want to talk about promises we've made first. So what, what kind of promises have we made to the girls of the world over time? And kids in general. So in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights claimed that everyone has a right to an education. So back in 1948, people were forward thinking, thinking, absolutely, everybody has a right to an education. Then, in 1959, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Child also stated that every child has the right for, of an education, including handicapped kids, um, and that, that, that education should be free and compulsory. Basically, the kids have to go to school at least through grade school, and that the education should be absolutely free. 1959. So, 2000. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Who's heard of the Millennium Development Goals? Great. A few folks have heard of the Millennium Development Goals. Millennium Development Goals said that by the year 2015, all children would have access to a quality education, at least at the primary level. 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals were set so that by 2030, we would ensure really, really that every child would have access to a free quality education. So let me tell you how we've done. So right now, there are 263 million kids around the world who should be in school and who are not. This is kids of primary school age, middle school age, and high school age. 200, quarter of a billion plus 
children who should be in school who are not. There are another 130 million kids who are in school but are not learning anything because of poor quality education, um, teacher strikes, and other things. So, in terms of promises, we've kind of done a pretty crappy job when it comes down to it. We've not done a very good job at keeping the promises we've made to the world's kids since 1948. And now, I'm not saying that things have not gotten better. I mean, these numbers are an improvement over what they used to be. So we're moving in the right direction. I'm going to give you one more sort of little projection here out into the future, but then I want to also talk to you a little bit about why this is important in the first place. So since 2009, um, development assistance, the money that is contributed to help countries who are, who are poorer than the United States and living in the poor circumstances, helping them sort of ramp up education and healthcare systems, that's increased uh, by 21% since 2009. So that's a good sign. We're, you know, we're helping our, our partner countries around the world. The challenge on education is that that, that development assistance, the percentage that is going to education has dropped from 10% down to 7%. So we're, we're investing less in education than we once were. So, and then based on this, so if you look at like, well, so what would it actually take to get the promise, the promise finally reached by 2030? On our current path, that actually will not happen until 2084. So we need to do something. We need to do something about this. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of what our advocates here are doing to try to make this happen, what Results is doing to try to change this, because we have to change the trajectory. I promised myself when I started this advocacy work that one of the things I was going to do is going to help ensure that every child had a quality education. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to die breaking that promise. You know, I want to get this job done before I go in my time. So why, why is this so important? Um, I guess just because we know that when, when kids receive an education, all sorts of good things happen, particularly women and girls. You educate a girl, um, she is going to get married at a later age. She's less likely to get involved in a, in a violent relationship, an abusive relationship. She is twice as likely to vaccinate her kids. Her kids are more likely to survive once she has them, because she knows what to do. Um, uh, her kids are gonna be better nourished. She's gonna have fewer kids. So that also relates to the climate. Um, educate a boy. Educate a boy, and, and this is true for girls as well. You educate them for every year of extra education, their lifetime wages will go up by 10%. That's what research is telling us. That's huge. That's huge for the family. That's huge for the individual. That's huge for communities. That's huge for countries. Um, you educate a boy, and particularly those who are in living, living in conflict zones, for every year that you provide to an education to a boy, their chances of reducing being involved in armed conflict is reduced 10 to 20%. So you think about it. I mean, we, when ourselves here in the United States, we know that when a young person is not in school, we're really concerned about what they're doing, right? What their lives are gonna look like. That's true everywhere. So, um, so again, as I, and I, I wanna relate this back to just my, my own experience. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the country of Niger in West Africa. We had a school in the village, but there were uh, kids from the outer areas that couldn't go to the school because they were too far away and not all the kids went because they were staying home doing chores. And then of course there were previous generations that um, were not educated at all. And I thought about um, people like um, Nuhu or Noah, in, in, as we would say it. Noah, we would have these great discussions and, and Noah couldn't read a lick. I mean, he never was never educated, whatever else. But he would ask me questions like, so, so tell me about, like, so, so the moon, it seems to me like the moon is kind of going around the earth, and that as when the sun comes up, you know, basically that we are sort of passing around the sun, and, and he was talking to me about, you know, theories that he had developed on his own, things that we learned in school, but that he had figured out on his own. Just imagine what kind of scientist knew who could have been. 
And, and, and um, uh, Adamu um, would have been a, an amazing humorist. He would have tr truly been a comedian. He could make everybody in the village laugh, thinking the writing that he could have done and the, and the comedy that he could have done. And then Ad Adama, she, was, um, she had, been, had some education. She had gone to uh, school at the local grade school. Welcome, ladies. And um, there you go. And um, and she was she you know with a little more education, I think she would have just been an absolute leader of the entire community. I mean, she was just phenomenal. I'm really commanded folks, really uh, smart and, and and just an amazing woman. She ended up getting married at 16 and uh, off to another village somewhere. But I think about situations like that. I think about everybody that I would run into and the possibilities that they could have had had they even learned to read or write. And you think about right now, so the way technology is changing in the world, that we you know, have access to so much information on just our cell phones, and, and cell phones are ubiquitous. Cell phones are everywhere in the world now. I can call the village where I was a Peace Corps volunteer. They're still not running water or electricity, but boy, you can call a cell phone out there, which is pretty awesome. Um, but again, think about the person who's literate. You don't have to wait for a book to show up to you because so much information is available out on, on the internet right now and people can be educating themselves just with the facility to be able to read. So again, the possibilities are great if we can actually get that kind of education to everybody. So how do we change the trajectory? So we've been advocating for an organization called the Global Partnership for Education and Salamo is gonna tell you a little bit more about its impact in Ethiopia in a second here. But we've been advocating for the Global Partnership for Education. We feel like it's one of the few organizations that has the, the, the strategy and the capacity to really um, impact education on a, a massive global scale. Um, in February, they are um, trying to raise $3.1 billion for a three-year plan. Their plan over the next three years from 2018, 19, and 20 is to get an additional 25 million th kids through school and then to impact the access and quality of education for 800 million kids in 89 nations. And they, they've got a good approach. They're working with countries to develop national education plans. It's not just with the governments either. It's the PTAs, it's the foundations, it's the, uh, the, the, the governments like the US that are providing development assistance, it's parents. And they're really looking at how do we reach every child with a quality education in our country. Let's create that plan and let's get the funding for that plan to make sure that we do it. So they are one of the best bets in really changing the trajectory in education um, we've got going for us. And they want to ramp up their funding capacity to be able to fill funding gaps um, over the coming years um, from uh, to get to two billion a year that they're providing and then four billion a year ultimately. And these, the, the Global Partnership for Education is not just giving money away. Every government that they work with, they, re, they require that, they, that, that those governments put 20% of their national budgets into education. That's, how the, that's part of the partnership. They have to commit 20% of their national budget to education. So this is not just a one-way thing. And then the money that they, they raise, the $2.1 billion that they're trying to raise in February from all of the world sources is to fill gaps. So again, we feel like this is one of the ways we can actually change that, 20, that abysmal 2084 number and, and sort of try to rein it back in and bring it closer to what we can tr try to achieve by 2030. So, um, so that's kind of where we are right now. I want to, we probably need to get moving, yeah? Yes, please. I have two slides, is that okay? Go or? ahead, yeah. All right, so I got two slides here, and I'm gonna turn it over to Salam Wet. <coughs> I don't know if you can see this or not, but this kind of gives you some progress towards education for all. Um, so primary school enrollment in 2000 was at 83% of the world's kids. We're now at 90. So again, some progress made there. Uh, youth literacy rates, 83%, 91%, said going up. Girls enrollment, basically huge jumps there from 82 to 90%, and again, really on parity with, with boys at this point. Domestic expenditures of education as a percentage of GDP, 3.9% um, to 4.7, to, uh, and then education share of total aid, which I mentioned earlier, has gone from 10% down to 7%. So this is the unfinished work here. You got the 263 million kids out of school, 130 million kids you know, in school but not learning. You got 61 million primary and lower secondary uh, school age girls out of school. That's just girls. And then Education Financing Commission has called for 
of domestic expenditures uh, to go to this. And then um, we actually need to fill this funding gap and ultimately by 2030 we want to get to free quality education for all. So this is what we're doing here. So I'm going to turn this over to Salamowit. She's going to tell us a little bit about Ethiopia and, and the work of GPE in Ethiopia. I'm Salama Wade. Uh, I'm originally from Addis. I, I was born and raised in Addis Ababa, the capital city in Ethiopia. And how many of you are aware of Ethiopia? Oh, good. <laughs> That's a good start. Uh, and I live in DC right now. I work as a UN representative for a Ghana based organization. Uh, it's a pan African organization, and we work with uh, young women leaders all over the continent who are implementing their own community, uh, their own community projects. Uh, we have uh, fellows in Uganda who are implementing projects in HIV AIDS, and we have fellows in Zambia who are working on girls' education. Uh, and I, I also serve as a global youth ambassador for a world at school, which is a partnership between young people, civil society organizations, and policymakers, and we are tr we make we're trying to make sure that education is a priority uh, in every development agenda. Um, so we are here today to celebrate the International Day of the Girl Child, and happy International Girl, Girl of the Child to you. Uh, as we are celebrating here, it's it's all about like empowering the girl child all over th the world, and uh, sadly, as we are celebrating. This day, uh, one in three women all over the world are subjected to violence, and more than half of that is like uh, is how it's the girl child. Every five minutes, a girl dies as a result of violence, and one in uh, one in four gets married as a result of in a child marriage. Um, this is a global statistics, and. Can mention that 260 million children are out of school right now, and out of that, 130 million are uh, girls. And we all know we, we've been uh, talking about this. Education is a powerful tool to to lift girls out of poverty, and it's a powerful tool to fight back the violence. Um, right now, like out of that 260 million the majority of girls that are out of school are in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, globally, Pakistan has the highest out of school children, but then it's Nigeria. Uh, then it's Ethiopia, it's my country. We have like the third out of school children in the world and like the second in the, in the continent. There are a lot of barriers that are, uh, that are hindering us from achieving this, uh, the, the Millennium Development Goal we have talked about and the, the, the 2030 goal that we want to achieve in 2030. Uh, one of it is like affordability. 35% uh, of the population, Ethiopian population, lives under the poverty line, which is, according to the World Bank, a dollar and 25 cents right now, right? Yeah, they just, they a dollar and 90. So more than that, of percent of the population lives under a dollar and 90 per day. So they, would, they are not able to send their kids to school because of like educational expenses. Uh, the other thing is like safety, like schools are not safe uh, because of the infrastructure, they are far, uh, and also the value that's given to girls' education. Uh, so they choose their girls to, like they don't see their girls like being a doctor because they don't have like a role model in that community and uh, they choose their girls to marry early or like they there's a high uh, child labor exploitation in that areas in those areas uh in ethiopia one out of i mean 50 percent of the population uh 50 percent of the ethiopian girls marry before the age of 18. it's a huge number and one out of three marry before the age of 15. i wanted to tell you a story of like two girls uh the first one is, her name is Amsale. I met her in 2014 while I was working for a nonprofit uh, that was working on girls' education and uh, survivors of um, early marriage. Uh, she 
like when she was 10, she, uh, she was given to a 32 year old uh, man as a second wife. Um, that like the last time that she went to school was like the Friday of the, her wedding weekend. Um, then she started like having responsibilities. She started taking care of the family as a second wife and as, as, as the youngest wife, it's her responsibility to make sure that like Thing. there's food in the house and there's water in the house she'll fetch the house so she had to drop out of the, the, the school um, and it's guaranteed that Amsal's life is uh, she's going to live under the poverty uh, under like extreme poverty and her children are going to live under extreme poverty and they are not going to go to school right it's the cycle it's going to continue like that and uh, when she was 13 she became she became the ma a mother 14, she gave birth to a second child. 15, the third one. Then she had a complication. I don't know how many of you know, know about like fistula. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like when, because of like, she's young and her body is not ready to have like three children. So that's when we made her like uh, the hospital that was taking care of her, they linked us with ours so that we can support her. So Amsa's life is going to continue like that. It's you know, like, unless she's getting to get support, right? And I'm going to tell you another story. There's a girl named Hannah. When she was seven, uh, she went to a country, one of, it's in, in, a, in, a, in a region that where her grandmother is living. It's a, it's a village. And she went to see her grandmother and she made a friend and she wants to, con to continue that relationship and she wants to have a, like, kind of, Pimple, that's the word? Mm -hmm. Yes. So then, but she couldn't reach out to her friend because she keep writing, but her friend is not returning back. And when she asked, she has been told that it's because of, like, she doesn't have a pencil to write. So she started, like, collecting pencils and sending back to the college. And that's how she started her pencil mountain project. And it became a big, a big project. In 2014, she was selected as UNICEF's ambassador for her role in girls' education. So what's the, the difference between like Amsal and Hannah, right? It's Amsal have been like, is facing this kind of life because her parents didn't go to school. And because she's not going to go to school, like her kids are going to live in the same cycle. But Hannah had this opportunity because her parents gave her that, that the basic rights that she needed to have. So this is why um, I, I, I support the Global Partnership Education and partnership that make education the priority. Uh, if we achieve primary education, like for all children right now, we are going to be able to beat poverty by 12%. We are going to reduce that. So, but this needs partnerships, this needs political will, and this needs financial commitment. The global partnership education makes sure that uh, countries like Ethiopia, like my country, uh, set percent of like their uh, GDP to education expenditures and make sure that countries like the US, the Uni um, United Kingdom, Australia also contribute to the, to attain the education development goals that we are having right now. Uh, since joining, we, Ethiopia joined the, the Global Partnership Education in 2004. In 2004, we only had 10 million learners. Right now, like it's the 2015 report actually, we have over 25 million learners. So we achieved this because of the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, I just, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank you for the support and I want to thank you for being here and making the concern of 260 million children is concerned in showing up on a, uh, on a Wednesday evening, on a school night. Thank you so much. Like all the, the declarations, like the global de declarations, 
in Ethiopia, we ratified the chat, the, the thing like the children, CRC, Child Rights Convention, yes. that prevents like early marriage. And we have clear uh, policies and punishments, but it's like deported culture. And it's also like a result of poverty. So, but the government is doing a lot of work. Non-profit organizations are doing a lot of work. The, there are a lot of like projects that are being implemented by the USA and uh, DP, like the UK, but still there's a lot needs to be done. Do we have any other questions before we go on for either one, either Ken or Selma? All right, cool. <laughs> and they're gonna be around too, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them as well. Um, so, do you want to talk about global partnership education, or do you think you're pretty good on that? Um, I, I, I would just say one last thing on the global yeah. partnership for education. I think I gave it a fairly good overview in terms of how they work, and part of those national education plans would include how do you actually reach the communities that are a little more resistant and, and suspicious of education, and, and convince them that, that their kids are going to be better off going to school and mm -hmm. stuff. So that's and it's done culturally, you know, and in, in right. with the local people and, and leadership to do that. So yes. That is part of their plans. Early childhood education is also being incorporated into those plans, so preschool and things like that. Starting kids out at a very young age is also another part of that. And then I would just say that in terms of what we are looking for from the United States, I mean, what results is, is advocating for is that in February, that the United States show up and that we pledge over a three-year period $337.5 million. That's the, kind of an odd number, but that's the, we figure the US portion of that. And Results has entities in um, Canada, Australia, um, the UK, Japan, Korea, and a bunch of other places as well. But between the United States, uh, the UK, Canada, and Australia, that those four entities would um, ultimately contribute 40% of that total $3.1 billion is what we're trying to achieve from our four countries. And the United States is not by far the biggest giver. I mean, 337.5. If you think about that as a percentage, it's a bit over 10%. The United, the United Kingdom, is their pledge, we're hoping they're going to come up with $500 million. So <coughs> tiny UK is going to do more than the United States. Question? Where is that money going? It will go directly to the Global Partnership for Education. So the United States would grant it to them. 89 different countries. Basically, it would, it would be, the, it goes towards the larger pledge of the $3.1 billion. And then the $3.1 billion is used uh, to get those 25 million extra kids through school in various countries, and then also to support 89 nations in improving their educational access and quality. Each of those countries has their own plans, and the Global Partnership for Education works with each of those countries on their own plans. And then where there's a funding gap, there might be a $50 million funding gap for building schools or providing books or teacher education, then the, the Global Partnership for Education will say, government, you've covered your 20% of your budget, not GDP, but budget uh, of this. You've got a great plan, and we see that you know this much money has come towards this. You have a $50 billion, million dollar gap, so we're gonna help plug that gap for the next three years and make, you, you know, make sure that you complete your plan. So that's where the money goes. It really is parceled out based on need and planning and how well the countries are, are sort of stepping up to the plate on their own education. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Great. So that's it for me. All right, thank you. Um, also, I'd like to note, point out that Ken actually came all the way from North Carolina, too. So let's give him a round of applause for all that. Um, all right, so now we're going to have Kate Ash from Senator Leahy's health office. Moved. Thank you for sharing what you're here to share. This is really moving. Um, my name is Kate Ash. I work as a field representative for Senator Patrick Leahy, and I have the best job in the world <laughs> um, because I get to travel Vermont and I get to help learn about what's going well in Vermont. I get to travel the state and I get to work with our communities, our partnerships, our students, our leaders and really learn about how Senator Leahy can use his position as the Vice Chairman of Appropriations and our most senior Democrat in the United States Senate to promote Vermont's vision um, for our country and, and for our world. And so to be here on his behalf this evening is, is really a pleasure. And um, I'm not gonna go through a whole set of remarks here necessarily, but I, I do just wanna share a couple of thoughts on his behalf. Um, 
you know, on this International Day of the Girl, I, I was over here and I was thinking about a story that Senator Leahy has uh, told a lot um, the last couple of years, uh, last, last year, last several months. And um, it's one of his favorite stories, and he recounts this day right after the beginning of this year in Washington when he decided to push out on Facebook an invitation to Vermonters that were coming down for the Women's March. Mm -hmm. And he decided to, at the Vermont House, host uh, Vermonters, um, women, men, all, all types of Vermonters to go down and actually participate at this. And as staffers, you think, okay, 100, 200 people are gonna show up. And as a staffer, I can tell you um, from personal experience, you do not want to run out of coffee and donuts for cold Vermonters who are about to march in the mall. And that's exactly what happened because instead of 100 or 200, we had over 500 Vermonters that showed up to share in that message about promoting women's equality and the global health of, of women. And um, he and Marcel uh, marched along with Vermonters um, on that day. And he continues to tell the story of the Women's March about that being one of his favorite moments and proudest moments of being a Vermonter um, and a senator from this state. Um, you know, during his time, women have come a long way. Um, you know, he championed the Lilly Ledbetter Act, um, which um, created um, requirements for, for equal pay in the United States. We've seen the first female presidential candidate, um, despite our best efforts. Um, and um, we have so many wonderful women, um, like we've heard tonight, who have come, come forward to tell their story to help us all be better educated and better informed about how to advocate for, for our, uh, our female community. There's a long way to go. And Senator, no Senator Leahy has noted um, that even in the halls of power in Washington, women are still being denied a seat at the table to debate our universal right to health care. There's still a long way to go in even the most powerful places in this world. Um, he believes that the unit, he knows that the United States remains a beacon of hope for where good things and human rights um, are respected and, and, and treated equally. Um, and so we've heard a lot about statistics. We've heard about um, you know, rates of growth. We've heard personal stories this evening. And I just want to share a couple of reasons why Senator Leahy is taking these statistics and these stories and, and turning them into policy. Um, last year, and, and for many, many years, Senator Leahy has championed what we call the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and this is a, a bill um, really to strengthen um, anti-trafficking um, work throughout not only the United States, but throughout the entire world. And I see a couple of familiar faces who are also part of um, Senator Leahy's 21st uh, annual Women's Economic Opportunity Conference. For over 20 years, the senator and his wife have hosted, have hosted hundreds of Vermonters that come to Randolph and learn about how to support one another, how to start their own businesses, how to educate themselves and their children, afford childcare. And we are fortunate to have uh, the Muslim Girls Making Change actually get to come and participate with us this year, which was a really wonderful addition. Um, you know, finally, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, this world work continues and um, sharing that global message of what Vermont is doing well as a community and, and why we're all gathered here on a Wednesday night continues to be a huge priority of my boss. Just last week, he hosted Malala, actually, in his, in his office in Washington to talk about promoting this message, to talk about promoting global education. And I myself got to help host um, the, the results group um, just last year when they came to meet um, in our office in Burlington. And the reason Senator Leahy can't be here himself this evening is because he's actually in Italy meeting with the Pope to talk about how to end, I'm forgive him, forgive him, forgive him. Um, but he's meeting with the Pope on how do we end this national, this international global refugee crisis because America deserves to be a place for anyone who can dream. These are some of the ways that Senator Leahy is turning these statistics, these stories into action. And so I wanna, I'm here on his behalf to encourage all of you to keep telling us your stories. Keep telling us and working with us to tell these stories into action. And thank you so much for being here this evening. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so next we have Katerina uh, from Senator, San Senator Sanders' office. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Um, so thank you to Kieran, thank you to Hawa, thank you to Dina and all of Results for allowing me to speak on behalf of Senator Sanders this evening. 
I first wanted to say I'm extremely impressed with this group of girls. They have come to our office. They are extremely prepared, um, and, and they really know what they're talking about. I, I think when I was their age, I was not this prepared. You guys are certainly going to go really far. Thank you. Um, so today, as we celebrate the International Day of the Girl, I just want to make it clear that it is a celebration. It's not because girls face stark barriers com when compared to their male counterparts, but because of the immense potential girls have that can truly change our world. So all of our work, I, th I think of this collectively, is central to the concept that all people deserve to live with respect and dignity. That no matter your sex, your gender identity, your income, your race, your family background, or anything else, that you still have a voice. And Senator Sanders has a big voice that has kept the door open despite countless attempts to close it. Um, he speaks up about access to health care, gender equity, reproductive rights, income inequality, and of course, education. So he's a member of the Senate Education Committee. And while early education, K through 12 education, and college are all important milestones in our lives, the purpose of education is to open our minds and to create a society better than the one we were born into. Prevention is education, discussions are education, and of course, information is education. It's imperative to our work that we keep people informed. So to having Salamo here today um, and speaking about the importance of education and Ken, um, it does exactly that. And I want to remind you that here, um, in Vermont and, and across our nation, education is paid for by taxpayer dollars. So all of you are able to come to school. That one barrier of, um, of affordability is lifted. But we often think of education as simply completing a grade or taking a test. Instead, we must think of education as a way of opening our eyes to greater possibilities and to more ways of working together. So when we consider the challenges girls face nationally and internationally, access to education, access to health care, protection from domestic and sexual assaults, it's not too far-fetched to simultaneously consider the better outcomes if we had better resources. We are half the population. We are half of the world's voices. So here in America, we have more political unrest than we've had ever before. I think that goes maybe without saying. Um, and, we're stin and we constantly have to stand up to threats against our health care, against our social safety nets, and to anti-discrimination policies. Um, just last month, our new Secretary of Education rolled back protect protections against campus sexual assaults. And last week, President Trump made it harder for women to receive birth control um, by expanding regulations allowing employers to eliminate birth control coverage from their health insurance. Um, and we've seen constant attacks on Planned Parenthood and abortion clinics. So I'm telling you this under the concept of we need to be more informed. We need to make it clear that girls are even more empowered when they have control over their bodies, when they have access to health care, when they have access to education and a livable wage. And those are just a few of the barriers we must overcome to ensure this success. So again, thank you for allowing me to speak today and join you, and I look forward Forward to seeing you all transform the world to, we know it, to what we know it can be. And now we have Elizabeth Morris from Representative Welsh's office. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to start off um, by saying how incredibly inspiring it is to be in a room surrounded by people who are so dedicated to making a change in the world. Um, I work for Congressman Welch out of his Burlington office, and I um, have the privilege of traveling around the state uh, with him and listening to Vermonters uh, doing what you guys are doing um, and really making a change. Uh, he gets asked a lot, you know, what can I do to help? People are really scared. Um, and concerned about what's going on in our world and our nation. And he always answers the same. He says, get involved. And what's amazing is so many Vermonters are doing just that, and every single person in this room is doing that. So I just want to say thank you to everybody here. And I think we should have a round of applause for everybody. Who's <laughs> so thank you all very much. Um, International Day of the Girl, 
presents an absolutely wonderful opportunity to focus on an incredibly important topic, and that's education for girls. Congressman Welch believes that all children should have equal access to primary school, according to the 2016 uh, Global Education Monitoring Report. Uh, 263 million children and youth are out of school, with girls more likely to be out of school than their male peers, and that is just absolutely unacceptable. Um, partnerships, partnerships, excuse me, between governments, community-based organizations, religious and community leaders uh, must provide girls with health care and education to improve their own lives and those of their families and communities. We are all in this together to create a better world. <coughs> That's one of the reasons why Congressman Welch is a co-sponsor of the Global Partnership, Partnership for Education Resolution. <laughs> um, which supports children's access to quality education in the developing world. When we educate girls in the developing countries, they learn about basic hygiene and science, the importance of hand washing and clean water. These are basic health issues that we take for granted in the US, but if girls didn't have this knowledge, they would suffer. Education helps girls and women understand their reproductive systems, helps with family planning, preventing HIV and AIDS, and other diseases. Um, empowerment is liberating and literally life-changing. In agriculture areas, when women learn better agriculture methods, productivity increases. Traditions in some society defined the roles of women as collecting and fetching the natural resources for family use, such as water and fuel wood. Educating women on how to maintain and improve the environment around them is important for everyone in the world, not just women. Congressman Welch supports the U.S. commitment to investing in efforts to improve access to quality education for the most marginalized children and youth, which promotes global stability, economic prosperity, and elimination of poverty. And it's not just the congressman who supports this. Uh, Vermonters care deeply about the world around them. Uh, Vermont has the largest number of former Peace Corps volunteers who have lived and worked all over the globe. And we know that the two most powerful obstacles to girls' education are poverty and tradition. Investment in education is one of the best investments we can make. So thank you all for being here today. So now we're going to close with a poem from Muslim Girls Making Change. So how and Lena, take it away. called Women's Role. Um, and so we wanted to discuss the issue, one of the barriers that women face in many countries of having this role of being the housewife and only having to be a housewife and having that barrier and not being able to attain education. So uh, before we start, can we do a couple of slam rolls? Oh yeah. yeah. So right. yeah, so if you hear a line that was very well said or that you resonate with, uh, you can just snap. Sure. Okay, so we'll teach you guys some chants that we learned at Brave New Voices, Bo Voices which was uh, an international poetry competition we attended last summer. And so the first one goes You put your heart into it. I know you did. I know. So if you guys want to say that back. <laughs> you put your heart into it. I know you did. I know you did. Okay, well, then the second one. So the second one, uh, it was, it's like a fun one we learned and we thought it would be fun to share. It's kind so of sort of important word, so it's from Texas, yeah. but it's here now. <laughs> Don't be Becky, Beyonce. <laughs> so if you guys want to say that one. Don't be Becky, Beyonce. Mop, washcloth. Do I look like a cleaning supply to you? Do, Do I, I leave your floor squeaky clean? I mean, yeah, I do. Right, Mom? Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> the truth is, we just watched a nice episode of Hoarders and think, damn, our house looks great. The laundry's done. I done did the dishes. I vacuumed so much that my back's about to break. Talk about 13 going on 30. Woo! <laughs> this is slavery. I already did my time. Why are women's hands meant to craft the art of cooking, cleaning, boy, I even do babysitting. 
Is it because mock sounds like mom? Is the kitchen the only home for our mothers with really on a welcome match for fathers? Why does the stove bring comfort like a fireplace only when the food is done? Open your eyes, because us women have bared this heat much longer than that. The gates of hell have been opened much longer than that. This heat has scorched our ancestors clean so much so it has ingrained itself in ours. This is our bloodline. We do not take the names of our husbands but the burdens of our mothers. Our brothers are taught to clean but has been guaranteed for women upon the womb. Why do women receive no credit? Do the creases in our hands not allow for justice, equality? Does this sweat not mean hard work? Is it just casualty? Does this blood not remind you of the aftermath of a genocide? We serve men as if this is worship, as if a temple allows for the cracked bones of a servant. Haven't you heard? A slave is only one if they are useful, strong enough, helps a master uphold his status. To you I hold nothing but the rank of my father, that my labor rules his happiness. Is this what it means to be a real woman? As if nothing else matters? As if 2017 kitchens still come with a warning sign, never let your son or husband enter, a line repeated over and over and over again that has become a promise, an expectation, a ticket to womanhood. This is what it looks like to be a woman, to be rewired back to the same routine, but still to, 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 for that as well. Um, so thank you all, really, like, thank you Howell, but really thank you to all of you guys for, all, for showing up tonight. Um, you know, it really does make a big difference that um, so many Vermonters were willing to come out in such a short notice to support women and, girl, all, women and girls all around the world. And um, if you guys want to continue this work, we'll be having a meeting, as I said earlier, uh, next Tuesday. Um, the register, you can uh, put your information down outside. We have some food left, so definitely get that. And thank you all so much for being here. And yeah, just thank you. <laughs>